It's really a shame in a way. The lections today are so clearly set up for a, a lovely sermon to happen <laughs> around the theme of how we ought to pray always and not lose heart from the, from the persistence of Abraham. Oh, how about if there are 20? Oh, 20, 10? All the way down to the knock at midnight. He will persist. He will get what he wants. One of Dr. King's great sermons, again, is based on that text. And he calls it not the, uh, fr not the uh, friend and the bread. He calls it the knock at midnight. I invite you to Google it up at some point. Alas, I was not drawn in the direction that, that the lections might have drawn another preacher this morning. So I want to stay, start by saying that people who used to take part in my Bible studies, say, in the jail or in a small group, sometimes when we're sitting down, a voice murmurs that they don't want to, they want to be careful not to get too stuck in the Old Testament. And I have sometimes wondered, maybe the Gideons wonder also, I have sometimes wondered if they do the right thing to produce only the New Testament in their wonderful pocket Bibles. Um, jail inmates were given to saying, that's okay, chaplain. I only want the New Testament anyway. Now, I think in the short term, that is perfect. Fits in a pocket. In the long term, it is a mistaken plan, I think, because, well, not even a, a counting. Let's lay aside for a moment the sheer love and deep, deep gratitude that a Christian should have for the Jewish people who led the way and who were chosen to bear the Messiah. Um, there are plenty of stories in the Old Testament and many points to be made, and, and Christians do well to go there and, yeah, get stuck there for a while. However, those who cobbled together our common lectionary have today offered us just a fragment of this important and longer tale of the twin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. I propose to yank that fragment out and kind of pick it apart. Our Lord Jesus, of course, knew the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, as he knew all of Genesis. He was a good scholar in Hebrew school, no doubt. He knew all of Torah and the later prophets. But those with eyes to see will notice that when Jesus spoke about the extreme wickedness of these cities, he did not refer to the sin of these cities, cities having anything to do with there being any gay men living there, if such there were. He did not seem to think that was the great sin of these cities, and so why should I? Why should any preacher? We should not want our Bible reading to be selective. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, ignore, for example, let's not, ignore, let, let's not ex ignore the repeated and repeated and overwhelming preponderance of the prophet's warnings about ethics, ethical conduct, especially warnings concerning the gap between rich and poor in their society. Especially, we ought not to ignore the Bible's reflections on the presence of the poor, the weak, the stranger, which is the same word as foreigner, as outsider in the old language. Now, I want to, here's a little list of let's nots. Let's not ignore what is plainly God's concern for all those marginalized and vulnerable people so that we can instead go chasing down a half a dozen verses out of some 31,000 verses in your Bible. Yes, I counted. <laughs> there are 120 chapters. When's the last time you read a book that had 120 chapters? Let's not leave the large message aside so that we can chase down these short, um, bits in a standard Bible. Some of those few are badly translated also, and they are so scattered that at times they can seem like random assertions. No, and especially, let's not do that hobby. In order that we can rush away to denounce people, to persecute, to grasp at the fearsome prerogative of God Almighty, and try our own puny selves to decide to exclude entire populations of people from God's kingdom dream. Let's not use Bible stories as screens 
to project our own negative values and justify them. See, I told you, it's in the Bible. It's in writing. They wouldn't be allowed to print it if it weren't true. <laughs> no, let us not dodge around the main issue by appealing to our naughtier selves. Always itching to state to our own state of grace, to, to judge that to be righteous, and you know, it seems not enough to win. Others must lose. It's not fun unless somebody's getting hurt, you know? I'm sorry that that is how we so often are. The gifts that our creator has given us, discernment to become wiser people, we hope, discernment and skill to build up and to improve things, love with which we should build one another up. Forgive us, Father God, that we, we use these things in the ways that we do. So no, I won't talk about whatever it was that our ancestors decided to name sodomy, that word that people give so many connotations to. Ugh, ay, pederasty, pornography, and while they're at it, bestiality. No, I want to talk about why God and Abraham are even having this conversation. The sin of the city Sodom and its evil twin, Gomorrah, is so grievous an offense against God that their names became, right, a proverb for true and pure wickedness. They were so evil that many centuries later, the Lord Jesus could still use Sodom and Gomorrah as a comparison when he was denouncing the attitude of, say, Jerusalem, refusing its prophets. And in that desert and hostile surrounding, when the most basic understanding was that water and rest, a meal, shelter, was always to be offered the traveler, there were towns that refused hospitality, refused to welcome and feed, and refused to give lodging. Jesus would say to those towns, no doubt about it, your sin is worse than Sodom's sin. Worse than Nineveh, that evil city. And you will remember, Nineveh had at least had the grace to repent of their evil. God tells us in this reading this morning that God will now go down there and see for himself. <clears throat> he will go down there and see for himself. But of course God knew, God knew that Sodom was beyond redemption. God must have known there weren't even 10 righteous, there were only, excuse me, let me say that, God must have known that there were only 10 righteous men in Sodom. So why did God permit Abraham to stay behind and argue with him, to do the sort of kvetching and counter kvetching that we're watching happen here? Well, there were scribes and rabbis who in olden times, and by that I mean medieval times, who produced much of the commentary on today's reading from Genesis. Here is an answer from one of them. This is Rabbi Ramdan. Simply this, the heart, he says, the heart of generous, the generous heart of God was delighted and warmed to see Abraham pleading mercy for others. The rabbi added that, you know, Noah had not done this. Noah had not pleaded for God to hold his hand back. So it pleased God that Abraham had placed himself alongside, that Abraham stood with what he hoped were the righteous in the city, the few righteous in that city. Now, I'm sorry to be about to give away the ending, but we do not continue the story after today. The lectionary breaks off, blows where it will, and it breaks off right where it, where it does. And it's important for you to know that after the meal, Abraham and Sarah's visitors went down to Sodom they went to Sodom, meaning to room and board with Abraham's nephew, Lot, in that city. Now, while they were there, men of the city, men of Sodom, came and surrounded his house, pounded the door, and demanded that the visitors be turned over to them so that they could demand to have sex with them. And it's important to know that Lot, the homeowner, came to the door and tried to offer them his two young daughters instead. Jews, both past and present, look to a whole set of medieval rabbis, as I said, especially for comments on these hard passages. These rabbis were not hemmed in, as indeed your modern-day Jewish neighbors are not. They were not hemmed in, 
as Christians often are, by the belief that if you're a Bible head of family, what you're doing is right. We often think that people like Noah and Moses and Abraham and so forth are being held up as some kind of moral example to us, as well as the other things they're bringing forward. Um, they did not force themselves, in other words, to say that if Abraham is doing it, it's okay. In fact, the Jewish faith argues with the Bible in a way that Christians are often shy of doing. The Jewish faith has entire schools of thought that analyze, that confront the written word. Sure, they would tell you anything else would be to deny the mental and moral capacity that their creator has given them. Now, one rabbi added to the discussion, he made bold to declare that Lot was most wicked to offer his daughters to the evildoers. He said Lot ought to have died before he did any such thing. And another rabbi says, you know, the great sin of these two cities was not simply that men raped in his patriarchal way. He said, that happens everywhere. But, he said, there was to him an even greater horror. This assault on Lot was not a random home invasion, but was in dreadful fact some kind of public policy that that particular Twin Cities, those particular Twin Cities actively endorsed. There's more going on here than in the written text. There are wheels within wheels. If you routinely attack and mistreat travelers, break up their caravans, scatter their families, see, you discourage them from wanting to come and live there. You get to keep all the city wealth yourselves. So the city of Sodom, he interpreted, the city of Sodom wanted this reputation. They meant, they intended should others, that others should take note, should fear them, and should pass on, please, don't stop here. And in fact, why don't you go back to where you came from? All of these rabbis know the word of the prophet Ezekiel much later. He was speaking in a different time to a different city. Quote, what after all was the sin of your, sis your sister city, Sodom? What was the sin? Was it not that she was haughty? She was full to the brim with pride, prosperously at her ease, filled with plenty of food, and yet she did not aid the foreigner, the poor, the needy. Unquote. Now note the wording, brothers and sisters. Nothing is said about liking them. Nothing is said about being friends with them or agreeing that they are marvelous, attractive fellows. Okay? There are going to be times, maybe lots of times, <clears throat> when you aren't going to like the people you're helping. But like your family, when you're mad at them, they need feeding anyway. Altruism. Let me back up, please. May we stand with a great German thinker, Reinhold Niebuhr. Altruism is not enough. Sympathy isn't enough. And what's that you say? But feeling sympathetic, that sounds so pious, so right, doesn't it? But truly, for justice and generosity to rely on my feelings of sympathy serves only to make my giving mood-driven. And it can even suggest that it's not a command I'm bound to obey. How often am I going to refuse a few dollars? Because I tell myself she's only going to blow it on booze. Do I need to examine my comfortable and, may I say, awfully convenient assumption about her? Maybe I should rethink my supposed right to make that judgment. Relying on my feelings turns me into someone who today happens to feel like welcoming the stranger, but tomorrow does not, and oh well. No, no. We're supposed to give simply because it is the right thing to do, because it is just. And here we have a link with the parable of the knock on the door at midnight. The friend who has already gone to bed, gotten under the blankets, turned off his cell phone, put it on mute for the night, put his phone on mute, says he will not, not even for friendship's sake, no, not even for friendship's sake, will I get up and throw off the blanket or light a candle or go get him loaves of bread. But see, in the end, he does do it. 
he does do it in the end, because he must. If he is to have any peace, let me say that again, he will get up and go to the door and do it, because if he does not do this just thing, he will not have any peace, including peace of mind, but not limited to that. It's a parable that comes rushing into this sorry world in which apparently mood-driven nations must push each other into endless wars, and which in the richest nation on earth, the poor guy is in town trying to find a place to sleep for the night, and he's once again being told there ain't no room at this inn, in which this country has, God forgive us, exhibition eating contests. Even the inmates are horrified at that spectacle, while others are happy to get a restaurant's backdoor handouts. All of these social ills are variations, right, on the old, on the old theme. Treat the other guy the way you want to be treated. We don't seem to be able to get there. It's, remember, it's so simple, but it's, it's not easy to get the mule to get there. Here's Deuteronomy 16. Yahweh's voice is coming thundering out of the desert. The voice cries, justice. Do only justice. And the text doubles the word for emphasis. The Lord from Mount Sinai is commanding it, and we just now saw Abraham insisting on it. Right to God's face, right? Far be it from you, God forbid, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Father God, think of justice. Think, think of your name's sake. Think of your reputation. Think of what those who don't already worship you are going to say. They're going to say, so, the all-just God of the Hebrews does sweep away the righteous along with the guilty. And here is a link with Jesus' care, shared this care for the name of God, for the honor of God's name. And it has been complicated up to this point. Okay, Fixing the social ills requires study, requires cooperation. Um, but hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. It's the very first petition in the great prayer. Shall not your name be blessed? And what to a Christian is the clearest, most transparent way to hallow God's name? Father God, we want to be like Jesus. We want to worship you and be like Jesus. And whenever we do succeed in uh, so surrendering ourselves to worshiping you in the beauty of holiness. Whenever we do that, we will turn toward his light, and it will help us grow into a good, good posture towards our creator. We will become more like him. Just like, once more, dear friends, if we worship political parties and flags and emperor's standards, we will turn toward them, and we will become partisan and militaristic. If we worship money, we will become banks and cash boxes, like old Scrooge and Marley. If we worship superficial personalities, our talk is going to become awfully superficial, as I think we're noticing. If we worship safety and security, our lives, like our homes, will cease all hospitality, and our homes will then have become fortresses of solitude. Let me finish by offering the brief wisdom of one of our visiting ministers in the jail. Barbara, I'm going to let Shannon have the last word this morning. She often engages the inmates on the simple subject of being more like Jesus. She describes Jesus in the Gospels, walking around and dealing with people. She talks about the two loves. She means at any one moment ahead of you, there are two loves worth struggling for. There were always two loves in the heart of our Savior. One, love for God the Creator, the giver of life. Two, the person you are with right at this moment. I pray that with God's love and grace, it might become second nature to us to recognize the two loves every time. Father God, increase and multiply your mercies. Is that, is that the colic today? Increase and multiply your mercies upon Christians and upon other godly people and upon all honest men and women of goodwill. Give us your good help. Give us your good help so that we might manage and pass through 
all the matters of this world as you would have us do, for we really want to, we really do want to play this game your way. And let the people of God all ask that in, in Jesus' name. Amen.